This week is Parshas Shlach, or Shalach, and Shlach means to send, and it, it tells the famous story of the Moshe sending the spies to scout out the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. And at this time, uh, notwithstanding all the mishaps that the people have had so far, they're still under the impression that they're only a couple of days away from going into the land. And, of course, the prudent thing to do when you're about to attack a uh, fortified position is to try to get as much data, as much uh, reconnaissance as possible. And the proper thing to do, of course, is to send in scouts or spies to go find out where the vulnerabilities of the enemies is and where you can attack him or where you could succeed in penetrating their defenses. Of course, that's the prudent thing to do. And we read today... Moshe is going to send uh, 12 leaders of the people. These are heads of tribes. These are great uh, uh, tzaddikim, righteous people. And they're going to go scout the land. But unfortunately, the report that they're going to bring back is going to be very skewed and very intimidating. And it's going to cause the people to really you know, just lose it. And as a result of this, it's going to be decreed that the Jews are going to need to spend 40 years in the wilderness. They're not going to go in, right? Right now, we're still a year after they left Egypt. They spent roughly a year at Sinai, and that's it. They're ready to go. It's not so far. You look at the map. It's not so far at all to go in to the land of Canaan, but the decree is going to be meted out uh, in this week's parsha that they're going to have to be there for 40 years, uh, and that everyone who, all adults, with the exception of the Levites, that are alive today are not going to be alive at the time of the entrance into the land. That's the, the story of the parsha. Now, you look at the very second verse. Hashem tells Moshe, send for you men to go scout out the land. And Rashi points out that this is not a direct instruction. It doesn't say go send. It says send for you or send if you want, if you please, if you choose. What the Almighty is telling Moshe is that this is optional. Normally, you have an instruction of the Torah. It's mandatory. You're saying, if you choose to send, you could send, but you don't need to send. And Rashi tells us that the uh, that the the reason behind the rationale behind that is that you know God tells you, uh, I'm going to bring you into the land. You don't need to worry about what normal people do in normal battles. This is not a normal battle. This is a battle that you have the guarantee of the Almighty that you'll be successful. The whole idea of trying to measure population and look at fortifications and see defense lines and all that stuff, that's if you're going into a normal war that is being run like all wars are. It's men against men. But if you have God on your side, it doesn't matter what the defense is of the enemy is. It doesn't matter. So if you're sending, it's you choosing yourself to send. That's what God's telling Moshe. Now, Moshe, of course, he understands that, but he recognizes the people are a little bit wary. The people, they want to send in spies. They want to cover all bases. And one of the themes of the parasha is the fact that we choose the relationship that we have with God. Had the people just relied on God entirely, then God indeed would have made that worthwhile. He would have proved that their reliance on him uh, was correct. But once the, the people decide to downgrade the relationship, to not rely on God entirely, and to rely a little bit on the normal course of events, when you're about to attack a nation, you, you, you just that, – that's what, that's what you do in normal warfare – Okay, you want to have normal warfare? You get normal warfare. And normal warf- in normal warfare, the people who is the, in the entrenched position is probably going to win. But this is kind of a, a, a theme that we see very broadly throughout all of uh, Jewish philosophy that we get to determine on what wavelength the relationship that we have with God. We looked at Sadiqim, for example, that they God watches over them and miracles happen to them. Well, why does miracles happen to them? The truth is that no miracles actually happen because a miracle is a departure from what's expected. But if it's expected that God will provide for you, then it's not a miracle. If you don't expect that God will provide for you, 
uh, then God won't provide for you because otherwise it would be a miracle. And miracles don't happen. Just, just people get treated in the way that they deserve to get treated. And that's why uh, when the Jewish people, for example, for 40 years are consuming manna, and you see, obviously, it doesn't impact them because they still make huge mistakes. Well, what do you mean? This miracles. Well, the answer is that, well, yeah, it's a miracle for us, but for them at their level, it was normal. And therefore, it didn't really change. It didn't upend. It didn't, it didn't uproot their free will. Uh, and here, the people are saying, we don't, we don't want to rely on a miracle. We want to send in the spies because there's a general principle, ain't somchem al you don't rely on a miracle. And therefore, they felt it's prudent to send in spies to scatter the land, even though God promised, sure, but let's cover our bases. And Moshe this is another interesting angle of it, Moshe obviously knew that they don't need to send in spies, but Moshe acquiesced to the will of the people. Of course, Moshe himself, he understood that you don't need to send in the spies, uh, but because the, the, the role of the leader is not to impose their level, so to speak, on the constituency, it's to deal with the constituency on a level that they already are at, and therefore Moshe senses that the feeling on the street is that we need to send in spies, and therefore he acquiesced and sent in spies, but he chose, who, who are we going to send in, the, the most deft scouts? No. The people that are least likely to get corrupt, the leaders of the nation. And it lists over here the leaders of the, na- of the nation. Um, some of them, of course, are very famous, like Joshua. Joshua was one of the heads of uh, the tribe of Ephraim. And, of course, he's the next leader, Moshe's heir. And uh, he is one of the leaders. But, in fact, if you actually look at it, he's not the greatest of them either. You would think Joshua, of course, is the greatest. Joshua is about average uh, with respect to these 11 of his colleagues that are joining him to scout out the land. So Moshe figured what he'll do is he'll choose the people that are least corruptible to go do this very perilous mission of spying out the land. Now, there's another amazing Rashi. I think it's one of the f- fundamental Rashis that we need to learn as introductions to Torah. Uh, also, in this, uh, the first Rashi in this is Parsha, which, as an aside, there's this tradition that if you want to understand the tenor of the Parsha, you always look at the first Rashi. Just the first Rashi, and he'll set you kind of on the, what's the theme of the Parsha. So, Rashi asks the question regarding the juxtaposition of the last thing in last week's Parsha, which is the story of Miriam's Saras. Miriam spoke negatively about her brother and she was punished as a result to the first event in this week's Parsha, the story of the spies. Now, uh, of course, the obvious question on that question is, well, maybe that's actually the order of events that happened. Why does Rashi ask why is it juxtaposed to the previous event, preceding event, well, maybe it just happened afterwards, and the Torah generally follows a chronological order. And the answer, according to the Maharal, is that indeed the instruction, God tells Moshe, go send spies if you choose, that actually happened before the episode of Miriam at the end of Lassie's Parsha. But Moshe chose to not pass on that instruction to the, to the 12, the seem 12 held to the tribe, until after the episode of Miriam. Now, what in the episode of Miriam is so crucial? Well, why is that important? Why, why does that impact? Well, Miriam, she spoke negatively about Moshe. She said, well, is Moshe so special? We're as special as Moshe. And she was immediately punished with Taras, with the spiritual affliction on the skin. And we know that the reason why people get Taras is because they speak negatively about other people or about the land of Israel, which is an extension of saying, speaking negatively about what God promises. And therefore, the episode of Miriam should have been a lesson for these 12 spies that they should not speak negatively about the land. And they saw it. And Moshe waited that they should see it. And they should learn the lesson. But they didn't. In fact, the words of Rashi are very famous. 
these, uh, I'll just read that from the beginning. Why is the episode of the spies juxtaposed to the episode of Miriam? Because Miriam, she was stricken with regards to matters of speech. She spoke negatively about Moshe. And these wicked people, these spies, they saw it and they didn't take Musar. They didn't take a lesson to heart. So if someone asks you, what is the definition of Musar? You might say ethics or philosophy or midos. Here we see what it is. Musar means when you see something, you apply it to yourself. They saw Miriam and they saw what she did and they saw how she was punished. And I'm sure they were moving, moved by it. Of course, Miriam was one of the matriarchs of the nation. She's Moshe's older sister and she's a great heroine. And she gets punished. Even Miriam's done. No one's above the law. And yet they see it, and it doesn't impact them to the degree that they're going to take a lesson uh, from it. And, you know, we think of Musa as a separate subject. There's, there's kind of Torah proper subjects, and there's Musa subjects. The truth is, Musa is a way, it's a format, it's, it, it's a kind of Torah study which you take it the last mile. You study something, you study a lesson, you don't let it remain just in your head, you bring it into your behavior, you, try, you integrate, you bring it the last mile that it should become part of who you are and how you behave and how you interact with the world. You should change. We are born as imperfect and the objective is to come make ourselves more perfect. And the tool that we have to do that was to, with, is, is Torah. Musar is the skill of taking the Torah and actually imposing that upon yourself so that you could actually change. That's what Musar is. And these people, they saw it and they could have learned the lesson, but they ignored the lesson and unfortunately, we all suffer the consequences. So the verse details who these people are, the heads of the tribes. All of them are great people at that time. Kulam Anashim, they're all great people. At that time, they're still haven't sinned yet. And these are the names of the people. Verse uh, 15, that Moshe sent to scout out the land. And he renames Joshua. Joshua initially was called Hosea bin Nun. And he rena- renames him Yehoshua. That's what the verse tells us. Now, what does this mean? That you know, we, The Torah, we know that the Torah has a, a thing for names, Right? Abraham is Abraham and is turned into Abraham. Sarai's name is, is changed. A lot of people have their names being tinkered with. Uh, Jacob has added a name. Um, but here, R- R- Rashi kind of exposes what the idea of name change is, is that Hosea, the word, the root of the word is salvation. But Yehoshua, which means God will save you. And Moshe recognizes the danger that Joshua, who was his apprentice, since he was a young man, that he's about to go into. And therefore, he prays for Joshua that God should save you from this plot of the spies. Now, what's really interesting about this, Moshe obviously is keenly aware of the grave danger of this, uh, of this pursuit uh, of, of the episode of the spies. He's aware even before beforehand. He knows that things could go wrong. Once people say, let me be in charge and not rely on God, then you're on your own devices and who knows what could happen. And he prays for Joshua. He doesn't pray for everyone else. Now, as the story plays out, Joshua indeed, he doesn't sin. Neither does Caleb. Caleb. But Moshe only prays for Joshua. The question is why? Wouldn't it be prudent for Moshe to pray for everyone? It's an interesting thing that prayer is not just dispensed like gumballs. Prayer is tailored for a specific person, a specific situation. Moshe, I guess due to his relationship that he had with Joshua and the way he understood Joshua's character was that Joshua was always trying to do what's right, and therefore Moshe made a decision that it's appropriate to pray for Joshua, but not to pray for everyone else. It's kind of an interesting idea. We think of prayer as just being throwing darts at the board, right? 
to see what sticks. Uh, the truth is, prayer is, is a calculation. It, it, it's someone saying, God gives us humans a role in decision-making of the world. It's not just God. We have free will. We're created in the image of God. And thus, who determines what happens in the world? Of course, it's God. But with our free will, we also choose. Well, how do we take a stake uh, uh, in this pursuit, in this challenge of determining what happens in the world with prayer? Prayer is when we take a seat at the table and we say, okay, decision-making of the world. Who's, who's in charge? Well, of course, it's God and every human that wants to partake with prayer. Okay, so Moshe sends, Moshe sends this coalition of 12 spies to scout out the land. He tells them to go from the south, to go to the mountain, to see the land, what the land is like, what's the nation who's, who's, who's in there. Are they strong? Are they weak? Are, are they numerous? Are they few? What about the land itself? Is land good? Is it bad? Are the cities in it fortified uh, or not? The open? Uh, Rashi, for example, tells us that if it's uh, – what, what, what demonstrates that they're strong when they're open? They're so strong, they don't need to build all these great defenses. And what about the agricultural qualities of land? Is, is, it, is it fertile or not? Are there trees in it or not? And take some samples of the fruits of the land and bring it back to us to inspect. That's what he tells them. Now, it's interesting here, uh, in verse 20, one of the things that Moshe tells them to look for is, are there trees there? Could you imagine a whole country with no trees? Obviously, that's not possible. So you look at Rashi, Rashi tells us, is there a tzadeh, a tree, of course, is always used in Torah literature to be synonymous with a man, with a person. That Tiha uh, Adam uh, Eitz Hasad. Man is, man is the tree of the field. That's what it says, a verse, scripture. Man is always compared to a tree. And the idea is, is that there's roots, for example. There are deep roots that uh, are beneath the surface you can't even see. When, says Rashi, when it says, is there a tree in there, is what it's actually referring to, not as a physical tree, is there any great tzaddikim in whose merit will have a hard time defeating the people. And it's interesting, you know, whenever we try not to understand the role of Rashi, Rashi, the verse says, is there a tree? Rashi says what this actually means is, is there a tzaddik there? Well, what's, going, what's it referring to? But the way, the Rashi's role is to give us the simplest understanding of the verse. The verse says, is there a tree? Obviously, it's not possible to have an entire nation subsisting in an area with not a single tree. We know that. So obviously it must be referring to something deeper, and therefore Rashi pulls one of the mid- Midrash, Midrashic sources that say, well, the tree is actually a hint for a, uh, a tzaddik. So they enter the land, they go up from the south, they come to Hebron, and they meet uh, these descendants of that giant that we talked about all the way back in Genesis. And they go to Nachal Astrol and they start to gather some of the fruits. And the verse tells us that uh, they it was the time of the harvesting of the grapes. And they took one cluster of grapes and they had to take it on two poles. It was so big. It's actually one of the morbid ironies of the modern state of Israel is that the symbol for the Ministry of Tourism are two men with poles holding a huge cluster of grapes that are the size of those men, aforementioned men. That's actually the logo. And, you know, these people who went in to scout the land, uh, this is one of the darkest episodes in the Torah, and it doesn't seem appropriate to choose this to uh, represent uh, the state. It's just uh, kind of ironic. You know, it's I, another, you know the, one of these ironies, uh, ben Gurion would always go on international forums and say, "Well, our deed for the for the land is the Torah," but then all the other people say, "Well, you don't actually believe the Torah. You don't observe the Torah." It's just come on, you know. <laughs> don't don't point out my uh, the, you, know, you know my contradiction, yeah, my hypocrisy. The fact that this could have been used, this amazing cluster of grapes, could be used in the positive sense is evident, and. I think one of the themes of this, of everything that they encounter, could be interpreted in two ways. 
as we'll see. Uh, it, it could be like, wow, what an amazing place. Who, you know, this sounds fantastic. I, I want to go there. Or it could be intimidating. Oh my goodness, look at these people. They're so big and their fruits are so big and they're, you know, us puny Jews, we have no chance. And they ch- unfortunately chose the latter. Um, okay, so they go and they finish their 40 day trek. It's a 40 day trek, which is pretty fast. And um, we're told in the sources that the Almighty gave them some superpowers to go through the land very quickly. And the reason is because there was uh, the decree ultimately resulted was that every day that they spent standing on the land resulted in a year in the wilderness. And in order to prevent this from taking too too long, they might have made sure there was a minimum of forty a maximum of forty days in the land and no more. And that way after forty days they could come back and the resulting decree would only result in forty years, not in 150 years or whatever. Um, so they go into the land in 40 days, they come back to Moshe and Aaron, and um, they gather the whole nation. Everyone's going to hear what their, their their discoveries were, and they show them, first and foremost, the fruits of the land. And they tell them, we came to the land, and yes, it's true, it's, it, it does flow with milk and honey, and look, at these are the fruits. That's the, the beginning of their of their speech. Now, if you look at verse 26, they went and they came. That's really how it starts. They went and they came back. So it juxtaposes the way they went and the way they came back. And the sources point that just like they came back with bad intentions, with ill will, so too when they actually left to go, there was the remnant, the, the, the kernel of the bad intent already there. They left and they came back with the same feelings, with the same motivation. And the Kabbalistic sources say that the reason why that they actually, the underlying biases for them not wanting to enter the land of Israel, because after all, they were, they were princes, they were leaders, and they liked their cushy jobs. And they were scared, what's going to be that they're going to the land of Israel, and who knows what's going to happen? Maybe there's going to be a realignment, and new leaders will come and supplant them. And therefore, they were motivated to try to make coming into Israel as least appealing and thus maintain their stature. Now, what's interesting, this is an example of, of, the, of the Torah plumbing to the depths of someone's internal biases that they may not even be aware of. If you were to ask these people, why are you slanting everything towards the negative? Why? They probably wouldn't even know because they weren't even aware of that. But deep, deep down, the Torah is able to reveal that at their core, they were motivated by the fact that they wanted to maintain their supremacy. And therefore, when they went already, they had something within them. And I'm sure they they weren't even conscious of it. They weren't even aware of it. There was something already there that was driving them towards finding the negative when, of course, so much of the positive uh, was possible to draw out. Now, you look how they craft their story. So what's their first sentence? The first sentence, we got to the land, and indeed, it's flowing with milk and honey. They start off very positively. And this is one of the sources in the Talmud that every falsehood has to have within it a kernel of truth. Falsehood on its own will collapse. It has to always have some itty bit, some small element of truth that upholds it. If it was just shaker, just falsehood, it doesn't have any legs to stand on. That's what the Talmud says. And, you know, there's an interesting Talmud about this. A very counterintuitive, my grandfather would always talk about this uh, with regards to communism. Now, politics aside, we don't talk about politics, but uh, everyone can agree that communism failed. Can we agree on that? That's a fair. But, but why? Because it's, it's false. It's falsehood. But it had within it this kernel of social justice, a kernel of truth that there should be justice. And even though the result is the most uh, the antithetical, antithetical, antithetical to justice – 
but because there is some little bit of truth in it, it gave it a certain degree of sustenance for a period. But eventually, the falsehood overwhelmed it and it collapsed. But it, can, it won't even get a start without a kernel of truth. That's my grandfather would always like to say that about communism. Uh, but there's an, an incredible Talmud, and it, you read it, it doesn't make any sense uh, on the surface. The Talmud says, and I know we might be going to a little bit of a side topic, but the, the point is, 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 is germane. Talmud talks about Messiah. When's Messiah coming? It's a question everyone wants to know the answer to. Talmud says it comes in one of two kinds of genera- two types of generations. Either a generation that's entirely righteous or a generation that's entirely wicked. And of course, that those seem to be exact opposites. You know, what are the conditions to bring Messiah? Is it righteousness or is it wickedness? It doesn't seem to make any sense. Those are opposites. And the answer is, is that if a generation is entirely righteous, well, then there's no falsehood. A generation that's entirely wicked, that there's no truth, and the wicked combusts internally. Because the falsehood itself, if there's not even a shred of righteousness within it, it doesn't have the possibility to subsist, and therefore it collapses, and then all you have left is righteousness. Kind of a, this, there's two ways to get to the same result. Either a generation that's entirely righteous, or a generation that's entirely wicked, but which will result in a generation of entirely righteousness. Pretty interesting idea. Now, after they begin their preamble of it's really nice, it's really amazing, they start talking about the problems. What are the problems? But the nation that lives in there is powerful. The cities are fortified. And we saw the these descendants of these giants, these really big, big people. And there's Amalek in there. Of course, Amalek is the kryptonite of the Jews. These, If you want to steer Jews, just scream Amalek and all the nations that are there. And they start talking about how it's not possible for us to conquer it. And then you have the, the two uh, spies, Caleb and, and, J- and Joshua, start fighting back. And Caleb says, wait a minute, of course we're going to conquer it. And they've, they've started fighting back. No, we can't ascend. People are too strong. And they spoke evilly about the nation, the land which we have passed. Despite it is a land that devours its inhabitants. The people were huge. We felt like a bunch of grasshoppers in their eyes. We looked and they, look at these people are so big. We felt like grasshoppers. Now, as a side note, the the date when is the, when is this happening in the in the calendar? So, if you do the math, it's on the ninth of Av, uh, the day that is enshrined for eternity as a day of suffering, the day, for example, when in modern times the um, Warsaw Ghetto was liquidated on the 9th of Av. Uh, the expulsion from uh, from Spain in 1492 was on the 9th of Av. Uh, the destruction of Beitar, of, of, of Bar Kokhba and Beitar, was in, in the year 135, the 9th of Av. Uh, destruction of both temples and the ensuing slaughter, 9th of Av. When did that get started? When did it become a day of, of devastation and destruction of the Jewish people? Right over here. And who brought it upon the Jewish people? The spies and the people following what they said. Uh, and the, the way the Talmud uh, encapsulates this is they cried for nothing. I'm going to give them a reason to cry. You want to cry tonight? Sure, you'll get your reason to cry. Uh, not, and not a fake reason, a real reason. Um, now, verse 31 here, uh, the people, uh, the spies said, we cannot... The, na- the, the nation is too strong for us. People, they're too strong for us. So Rashi tells us that this was not referring just to the humans. This is referring to God. That the spies already are intimating that this nation is so powerful, even God, even God can seek it, right? Even God can seek the ship, right? Even God cannot uh, overwhelm this nation. And kind of look at it in the picture, in the prism of the whole Parsha, the Parsha is about the people choosing to forget about God and making a choice to try to live in the normal course of events, right? We have to send spies. That's the prudent thing to do in warfare. And that's, of course, the world we live in, right? We can't just say, oh, I'm going to study Torah and God will provide. We can. We have to live in the world. But here we see what the risk is of living in the world. 
the tension. Yes, we cannot choose to say we're gonna li- we're gonna rely on God and just He'll provide. Maybe only with some exceptions, like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who lived in the cave and God provided for him. But we have to choose. We have to, we have to live in the world. But here's the risk: you live in the world, and right away there is the risk of forgetting God, because they're opposites. Uh, this world, this physical world, where we see cause and effect outside of God, we have to live in that world. Yet, we have to constantly resist the fact to forget God because that is what this world is bringing us to. And we see the people, they make a choice to start living in the world and acting the way it's prudent, and right away, they start forgetting God. And chapter 14 begins the hysteria. People start crying. And why did Hashem bring us out of Egypt? So we should just die. We should be slaughtered. What's going to be with us? Isn't it, shouldn't we just go back to Egypt? And they say, let's appoint a leader. Let's go back to Egypt. And, um, of course, there's a, this is a terrible, terrible tragedy where they could have seen everything for the positive. They chose to see everything for the negative. For example, um, they saw that the uh, one of the things they said uh, the land is a land that devours its inhabitants. Everywhere they were going, there were funerals. It's obviously a place that's not a healthy place to live. Now, the truth is that every place they were going, there were, there were funerals. And the reason why is there's a positive spin to it. Imagine you have 12 rabbis who are totally out of place, and they start scouting the land and sniffing all around. Of course, that is going to raise some eyes, eyebrows. That's not a normal thing. So God gave them cover. Everywhere they went, there was a funeral. And everyone's so consumed with the funeral that they're not noticing these 12 rabbis in the back, uh, you know, sniffing around and trying to take some fruits and stuff like that. And instead of looking at the positive is that God's giving them cover, they say, well, uh, they look to the negative. And that, of course, is the core of their mistake. Uh, and the core of Lashon Ra is to find the negative, to seek out the negative and look at it and to, uh, to, to make that... Um, to make that conclusion. So they, they say, let's get rid of Moshe, let's go out to Egypt. Moshe and Aaron, they start to try to intervene. And Joshua tries to intervene. And Caleb tries to intervene. And they spoke to them, no, the land is very good. If Hashem desires us, he will bring us to this land and give it to us. Land of flows milk and honey. But don't rebel against Hashem. Don't fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. If God's on our side, the people will put up the same resistance, the same defenses that bread does to the knife. Uh, We'll just eat them up, no problem. But if, of course, Hashem is not with us, then you're right, we're toast. Because there's no way under normal circumstances, outside of God's oversight, that we can can overwhelm them. And the, the mob, the riot, does not want to be quelled. And they decide they're going to start attacking Moshe and Aaron and Caleb and Joshua and they start throwing stones at them and the glory of Hashem appeared in the tent of meeting and everyone quieted. Uh, The question is, what is the core root of this lack of faith? There's something underlying. There's some element of the Egyptian culture that they haven't yet expunged from themselves. And what becomes clear, what becomes clear in this episode is that there's something, all the members, all the adults that left Egypt, they all share commonality that is not going to go away. There's something there that is resistance to God, the leftovers of the idolatrous environment. It could be just plain old lack of faith or a a certain perspective that is too earth-centric, too physical-centric, that's not willing to Depart, they're not willing to depart from. But regardless, there's something there that becomes clear that now there has to be a whole new nation, a whole turnover of 40 years where there's a new generation that's going to be the ones coming to the land of Israel. Uh, initially, Hashem tells Moshe, um, I'm fed up with these people. I want to get rid of them. Uh, we'll start from scratch, which is exactly the same response that happened, by the way, after the Golden Calf. That they're very similar misdeeds. It's 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 actions that, of course, are not overt idolatry, but have 
kind of a hint of idolatry within him, of rejecting God entirely. And the same thing God says, okay, this is not the nation that, that we're looking for. This is not the Jewish nation that's, that's going to be the kingdom of priests and the holy nation that God's representatives in the world. It's, it's not it. I thought it was. It's not. We'll start from scratch. And both times Moshe has the same response. Well, what's Egypt going to say? You took them out of the land of Egypt to, to just kill them in the, in, in, in the desert? Now, of course, you know, who, what does God care what Egypt says? God can kill them as well. But the idea is, is that there is what's called a Kiddush Hashem. The, the, the idea of God selecting a nation is a degree of permanence to it. And God selects the nation. This is the nation. And yes, there's going to be some tumbles along the way. Uh, but when God selects them out of the land of Egypt, it has to be that this is the nation that will remain. And that's why what ends up happening is that God tells Moshe, Indeed, I'm going to accept what you're saying, uh, and but we'll keep the nation, but we're going to have the Jewish people stay for 40 years in the wilderness, and these people, that this generation is going to pass on, and the new generation that doesn't have as much of the Egyptian culture baked into them, they're going to be the ones that enter the land. Now, the back and forth doesn't seem, I mean, there seems to be kind of a, a a philosophical dilemma with regards to Moshe debating God. Like, how is it possible that Moshe is able to debate God and change God's mind? You read it simply, it doesn't, doesn't really, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't sit well um, theologically. I want to look here, if whoever has a copy of the Chumash, uh, on verse 17. You'll notice something very strange in verse 17 in the Hebrew side. Even if you don't read Hebrew, you should be able to see it. And that is that there's one letter that's much larger than the other letters. Uh, it's on page 806 in the Art Scroll Stone Edition of the Chumash. On the third line down on the right side. You'll notice there's a large letter, a large yud. So it, actually, if you look in the Torah scroll, that letter is large as well. There's a large yud in the Torah scroll as well. Now, what that is hinting at, whenever there's big or small letters... It's hinting at an expansion or contraction of God's midos. Now, what, are the word, what does the word mida even mean? The word mida means a measurement. Mida is a certain fixed quality. So what does verse 17 says? Uh, now may the strength of my Lord be magnified as you have spoken. What Moshe is is doing is asking God to magnify, to amplify, to expand his strength. Which strength? And he quotes what God said to him back in the Sin of the Golden Calf. Slow to anger, abundant kindness, forgives all kinds of sin, cleanses sin. There's a secret here. I want to share with you a secret. God is unlimited. One of the names of God uh, I'm not going to pronounce it the way it's actually spelled because you're not allowed to. It's, I'm going to say it the way it's spelled, the way it's said over. It's Shakai. There's a Dalit there. But we don't say that because that's God's name. But the word die in Hebrew means enough, sufficient, limiting. And the meaning behind that name is that God said to the world, die. God said to the world, enough. God created fixed measurements to the world. And what that means is, is that God himself was unlimited, but the world is limited. And why is the world limited? Because God decided, that's his calculations, of creating what's called God's midos, God's measurements. What are the fixed measurements of this world? Here, God tells Moshe, the people need to be destroyed. What that actually means is, in the existing framework in the midos, the measurements, the limitations that God placed upon the world, God, God gives us a certain allowance, for example. We know we, you sin and you don't automatically die. Why not? Well, that's an example of God's uh, elasticity, so to speak. God allowing someone to sin to a certain degree before God takes any retribution. That's part of God's leeway, the grace period. Well, that is what's called God's midos. God said, I'm slow to anger. I'm kind. I'll forgive if someone does tshuva. And that is up to a certain degree. Here, the Jewish people go beyond what God allows. And therefore, God says, I'm going to destroy them. And Moshe prays. What's Moshe praying? 
He's saying, Yigdal na koach. I want you to change the measurements, expand them, and go beyond where the people have trekked, and therefore to save them. What God is, at, what, what Moshe is asking God is to expand those midos, those fixed limitations. Of course, God's unlimited, but God to change how the world exists, how the how the God treats the world how he interacts with the world, and therefore to expand his kindness beyond the distance that the people have gone, and therefore they'll be saved because they're still within uh, within the measurements. And this big yud, what this means is, uh, this is an expansion. Every time there's a big letter or smaller, it's an expansion or a contraction of the way God treats the world. That's the secret. And in fact, if you look here, what does Moshe tell him? Verse 17. And now, may the strength of my Lord be magnified as you have spoken, saying. What Moshe is telling God is there is already a precedent for this. If you look, at it's uncannily parallel, the story of the golden calf and the story of the spies. In both cases, God wants to destroy them. Moshe prays. And Moshe invokes God himself, which almost never appears in the whole Torah. And Moshe is able to be granted an expansion of God's Midos. And that's why, I, if you look at chapter 33, 34 of Exodus, it talks all about God's Midos, God's character, kind and slow to anger and all that. And that is Moshe is able to uh, be um, granted from God an expansion of the way he treats the world and, as a result, a exoneration of the people. You look at the Yom Kippur prayer. What's Yom Kippur prayers? You know how many times we mention these verses in the Yom Kippur prayers? Hundreds of times. That's what it's all about. We're trying to do the same thing. We're saying is we, it's possible we may have traversed, on Yom Kippur we say it's possible that we, have, we may have traversed beyond what is allowable. And we're asking that God also changes the way he, crea- he creates and treats the world by um, invoking this prayer. God himself doesn't change. But God says with prayer, he can change the way he treats us. And it's, it, it, this is a, a subtlety which is very important. It's the very first page of Maimonides. Is that the way God himself is and the way God treats us are distinct entities. Because God himself is unlimited, the way he treats us is, is limited. And therefore, they, they're conflated in, in our heads because we don't imagine, we don't know that existence in our world where something is different than the way something behaves, so to speak. That's why when God behaves with anger, God's not angry. It's not possible for God to get angry. But God can behave with anger. That's a different thing. Of course, that's a subtlety, but that's the core of Jewish theology, is that God himself and the way God behaves are different entities. So Moshe is able to be granted this reprieve from God. God says to Moshe, I have forgiven like you have asked. However, I'm making a pledge. All the people that saw this exodus and the miracles and all that, and that now came into the wilderness and tested me ten times, and they didn't listen to me, they're not going to see the land of, of Canaan with the exception of Kalev and Joshua. And that's repeated again in a few verses. Now, what are these ten? So you look at the uh, look at the sources that talk about the ten distinct times since the Exodus. It's been a year and change, a year and a half. Ten times already they have tested God, and that apparently that seems to be like a certain like ten. We know ten is a big number. Uh, ten tests of Abraham or ten plagues. Ten is a certain clinching effect, um, and it's possible that because the people had ten misdeeds, ten strikes against them, ten strikes and you're out. That it, that essentially determines that there is an aspect of your wickedness that is irreparable, and therefore these people cannot get to the land of, of, uh, of Canaan. The core of these people, there's something about it that's corrupt, and therefore, and it, that's manifest by the ten misdeeds. Um, God tells all the people that were 20 years and up that left Egypt, they're all going to die with the exception of, of Kalev and, and, and Joshua. Uh, now, as uh, with regard to the the spies that were sent to the land, they actually died a horrific death in verse 37. 
and the people who spoke negatively about the land, about the land, they died and played before Hashem. Just quickly, this might be a little bit gory, um, but the Talmud tells us how they die. They die tit for tat. All of God's retribution is always tit for tat. It's always exactly what someone does. That's what they get, both good and bad. But what did they do? They spoke negatively about the land. What happened to them? It's a little bit uh, squeamish. But uh, Rashi tells us from the Talmud is that their uh, tongues expanded until their stomach and little animals crept into their stomach, into their navel, and killed them from inside. That's what it says. And that's me, the Kanegami. That's a tit for tat. Why? They spoke, they spoke with their tongue about negatively, and therefore their tongue um, had this un, unusual, unnatural death. Now, the question, of course, is what is, it, what is these uh, creepy crawlers that, that, that went into their navel? What is the belly button? What does that have to do with anything? How is that tit for tat? And the answer is that when someone speaks Lashon Hara, what they're actually doing is taking uh, – they're, they're taking worms. They're taking disgusting things and bringing them into their innards. And because the tongue, that's the touch point of body and soul. Speech is uniquely human because it's, it's a physical activity. Of course, there's the guttural and the teeth and all that. Uh, and the, right, it, it, there are physical attributes of speech – but it's also a manifestation of someone's soul. And therefore, when someone's speech is corrupted, that refers to someone's essence is corrupted. And therefore, how was that manifest? It's manifest with this terrible punishment. Now, there's a few defiant people in the end of chapter 14 that they decide that they're going to the land of Israel anyhow. They're right on the doorstep after all, and they decide to forge ahead. We're going. We don't care. Moshe tells them, don't go. You go. You're going to get slaughtered. Hashem is not with you. They decide defiantly to go anyhow, and they get slaughtered by the Amalekites and the Canaanites, and they die. What's interesting here is that their rationale was, was sound. They said, hey, our sin, the root of our sin was, let's go back to Egypt. Well, how do you fix it? You fix it by saying, let's go to Israel. And they thought, their calculation was, that the correct way to fix their misdeed, God punished them to stay in the wilderness because of their sin. Well, you fix the sin, you go into the land of Israel. Well, what was the sin? Sin was, we want to go back to Egypt. So how do you fix it? By determining, let's go into the land of, of Israel. So they said, we're going to forge ahead and that'll be our rectification of our sin. But it didn't work. Because repentance is not just undoing the deed that is the misdeed. It's Returning, the word, the word tshuva in Hebrew means to return. Return to what? Return to whom? Return to God. What it means is, is that initially, the actual core of the sin was not that they said we want to go back to Egypt. The core of the sin was that they went against what God wanted. And therefore, the way to do it, the way to rectify it is to go with what God wanted. And God says, stay in the land of, stay in the wilderness, and they chose to go in the land of Israel. So they did not indeed rectify the sin, and therefore, they did not have their protection. Now, chapter 15 begins with mitzvos. But you look at the introduction, speak to the people of Israel and tell them when you get into the land of Israel, you, when you bring certain sacrifices, you bring libations. Now think about it. This seems to be rubbing salt in the wounds. The nation was just told you're not going to the land of Israel for another 39 years. How cruel, maybe, is it cruel to be told, well, when you get into the land of Israel, there's a mitzvah. But I think there's another way to spin it, is that what God is actually comforting them. He's telling them, I'm going to give you a mitzvah because it's still relevant for you. Yes, you were just, you received the decree to spend another 39 years here wandering. But you should know, I didn't forget about you. You're still going to go into the land of Israel. I'm going to give you a mitzvah to comfort you and to remind you uh, about that. What is It is interesting that right after the sin of the golden calf, initially, they got the mitzvah of building the mishkan, building the tabernacle. And right after this sin, they got more mitzvos. And one of the commentaries, the Sephorno, one of the commentaries, um, he, in many places in the Torah, he says every time the people sin, they create another barrier between them and God. Well, a mitzvah is a way to penetrate that barrier. And therefore, the more sins, the more mitzvos. It's kind of ironic. Had the people not sinned with the golden calf, they wouldn't need a mishkan because they wouldn't need to have a designated place to come close to God because they would be wherever they want. They can become close to God. And ironically, there is a certain fringe benefit because now we have a more another mitzvah thanks to the golden calf. 
as strange as that sounds. And similarly here, after another sin, that creates kind of a greater hump for us to overcome in trying to get close to God, and therefore there's another mitzvah to help us achieve that. There's another mitzvah here, the mitzvah of challah, which the word challah today that refers to a loaf of bread actually comes from this mitzvah. The, the, the word challah, the, there's a mitzvah, uh, there's a mitzvah when someone is making a dough to remove a part of it to give us the kohen. Uh, today, we don't actually give it to the kohen because uh, this law is only fully applicable when the temple is extant. Uh, but what uh, we do do is take it and remove it at least. And there's a special blessing that uh, the women say. This is uh, one, of the, one of the three mitzvahs that is given uniquely to women. And uh, therefore, it's still, it's still extant today to take, remove challah from a dough. Uh, and he, some people burn it, some people throw it out. But of course, that is not that is uh, evoking the mitzvah of challah in this week's parsha. We get some laws about uh, people who do idolatry, and finally, we get the strange episode of the twig gatherer. Uh, the children of Israel. This is in verse thirty-two. We're in the wilderness. They found a man gathering wood on Shabbos, and they brought him to Moshe and Aaron. What do we do with him? They put him in custody. They didn't know. They knew that this was an executable offense. They didn't know which one, which method of execution. And finally, they were told that he needs to be stoned to death. Very strange episode. Um, so first of all, Rashi tells us, of course, the Talmud, that there is a juxtaposition between the story of, of the idolatry and the story of the Shabbos desecration because uh, someone who observes Shabbos is someone who is admitting to God's existence. Right, when Shabbos is the seventh day, because it shows that God created for seven days and for six days and ceased to create in day seven, and we model that and we demonstrate that with our behavior. And therefore, someone who desecrates Shabbos is someone who's essentially not doesn't believe in God. That's what Rashi tells us. But what's really surprising here is this gatherer. If you know a little bit about Jewish Jewish jurisprudence, you know that the only way that someone could possibly, can possibly be executed in a Jewish court of law is if there are witnesses and they warn him immediately before he does that said prohibited act. And the person, the uh, perpetrator, he actually accepts upon himself that he will be executed for doing that. So in, in essence, the only way for you to be executed in a Jewish court of law is if you want to be executed. But the question is, what was this guy's motivation? Gathering twigs and Shabbos, my goodness, that, that is something that is worth giving up your life for? It seems very strange. So the Midrash gives us a fascinating insight. Who is this individual? This individual is Slavchad. Slavchad, we're going to meet his daughters in a couple of chapters in the Book of Numbers, the daughters of Slavchad. Five daughters he had, and they talk about his mysterious death and the Talmud connects the dots for us, tells us this is Slavchad. This gatherer is of twins and Shabbos is Slavchad. And in fact, he is considered a hero in the Torah. His daughters are given great prominence because he actually prevented a major problem. After the people were told that now they're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness, some minority, a large, uh, uh, substantial minority of the people they believed, well, we're not going to the land of Israel. All the laws of the Torah are uh, absolved, are, 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 are not applicable anymore. So Tzlavchad, to demonstrate that the, to- the mitzvah of the Torah is still valid, deliberately gave up his life in martyrdom to show the people exactly the consequences of desecrating Shabbos, even in the most minor w- way of collecting twigs and Shabbos. And therefore, while he's not, I wouldn't call him necessarily a hero, but he is viewed very positively, and that's why we kind of give him his accolades through his daughters. The, the Torah is obsessing over his daughters, and the whole episode, we'll see where that comes in in a little bit, um, that uh, that he does have a certain legacy here, this Slavchad individual. Now, the Parsha ends... Uh, with a very famous section, the third paragraph of the Shema, which talks about tzitzis. This actually is a paragraph that we say in the prayers uh, at a minimum of twice a day. Hashem said to Moshe, speak to the Jewish people, make tzitzis in the corners of their garments, these things. 
Uh, on every corner, put a put a put a uh, a strain of tcheles of blue wool, and you'll should see the tzitzis and remember all the mitzvahs of Hashem. You look at tzitzis, you remember all the mitzvahs of Hashem. How do you how do you see all the mitzvahs of Hashem through tzitzis? Everyone tries to figure that out. Some say, well, it's on all corners, and therefore everywhere you turn, you should see your tzitzis. Which, by the way, the tradition that people have, some people have it's not a halacha, but some people have a tradition to wear tzitzis out. You ever see people have tzitzis dangling out of their sides? The reason why is because the verse tells you you should see it. Well, if it's tucked into your pants, how are you going to see it? Now, it doesn't mean the halacha is not you should wear it out, but that's where the tradition comes from. But everyone tries to explain how when you see tzitzis, you remember all the mitzvahs of Hashem. So, for example, uh, the, I think the Talmud says that the gematria of tzitzis is, gematria, numerical value of tzitzis is 600. Because every tzaddik yod is 100, so that's 200, and the tough is 400. So 200 plus 400 is 600. Plus, there's five, if you'll notice, there's five knots, and there's eight strings. So what's 600 plus five plus eight? It's 613. That's what uh, one of the commentaries said. I think it's, I think it's in the Talmud, actually. Now, the Midrash says something very fascinating, because, and it's it's fascinating, of course, just this very vivid imagery, but it's also fascinating because it does seem to expose us to what the core mitzvot are all about. The Midrash says that the tzitzis, you look at it, it's like kind of strange, right? It's ropes. Says the Talmud, it's actually Midrash in the end of this year's Parsha, that uh, it gives us an, an analogy. It gives us a parable. Suppose you have a person who is thrown overboard from a ship, and uh, they're now in a very wavy, chaotic, raging sea, and they're at great risk of drowning. So what does the captain do? Captain throws him a lifeline. He throws him a, a, a rope, and he holds onto the rope, and they pull him back on board. That's what the Midrash tells us. And the analogy is that we are in this world, like we talked about earlier, we have a body and a soul, and the body is pulling us away from God, and the soul is pulling us toward God, towards God. So we're, But we're in the body, right? The body has first dibs. The, the body has pole position. We're in this raging water. We can drown. We, forget, we can forget God. But God gives us mitzvos. He throws us this line. The tzitzis are representative. They're symbolic of the mitzvos. They're emblematic of the mitzvos. <laughs> And if you clutch the mitzvahs, you hold on to them tight, don't let go, then the Almighty, the proverbial captain, is going to pull you on board. You want to know how do you get close to God? According to Torah, through mitzvahs, that's the answer. Is that the mitzvahs are akin to a lifeline given to us by God. You hold on to the lifeline and he will pull you closer. What's interesting is that we kind of think that we need to do all the dirty work, right? We need to figure out how point A connects to point B. But the truth is, the verse tells us, you look at at the actual text of the Midrash, it says, all you need to do is hold on to the lifeline. Just do the mitzvahs. Just do them perfectly. And the result is that God will do the actual pulling, so to speak. You don't even pull yourself up. You just hold on to the mitzvahs. Don't let go of them. If you let go, you'll drown. But hold on to the mitzvahs. Don't let go of them. And God will do the dirty work, so to speak. Let God figure out how A plus B equals C how doing mitzvahs will bring you close uh, to him. And uh, it also demonstrates here, um, don't follow your hearts uh, and your eyes. And remember the exodus, which is, by the way, there's a mitzvah to remember the exodus every morning and every night. We fill that with this section. And, of course, the end of the of this parsha and the, and the section of, of Tzitzis talks about uh, Ani Hashem Elokeichem, I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt to be for you as a God, I am Hashem, your God. What this means is that the, uh, the ob- objective of the Exodus and the objective of our nationhood is that God is our God. That we are to be subject to him and we're going to be representative of him in the world. We're going to bring his message to the world. And that was the objective of the Exodus. And that is how we fulfill it through the tzitzis, so to speak, through the mitzvos uh, that we can do and that he gave us to accomplish that.